Okay, thank you very much for your patience. We're so excited to have you all here today. More of you will be streaming in, but in the meantime, let's get started because we have a lot of content to get through. Hello and welcome. I am Hafiza Rashid, the Senior Advisor, Communications and Outreach at the King Bodwan Foundation, United States. It's great to be here and thank you for taking the time today to attend the final episode of our October series on digital marketing. For those of you who are unfamiliar with KBFUS, please allow me a brief word. We enable US donors to support their favorite causes overseas. We also provide European and African nonprofits with cost-effective solutions to raise funds in the US through a tool we call an American Friends Fund. We have over 450 American Friends Funds, including the University of Nairobi in Kenya and our Karolinska Institute in Sweden, among many, many others. These funds save nonprofits in Europe and Africa the trouble and expense of setting up their own 501c3 public charity and KBFUS handles all back office administration, including tax receipts and donor support. So if you have donors in the US, feel free to reach out to me and we'll be happy to assist. And by the way, if you have donors in Canada or in Europe or in Asia, feel free to reach out as well, as we have partners that can help you with donors in these countries and regions. Contact information will be made available following the webinar. And this session is being recorded. I'd now like to introduce you to Liz Ngonzi and Kat Murphy. Thank you so much, Hafiza. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. Happy Monday to everybody. Um, Hafiza, I just wanna let you and the uh, KBFUS team, as well as the Giving Tuesday team uh, to know that how much I'm grateful for the opportunity to develop this series with all of you. And Kat, thank you so much for joining us. I know how early it is for you being in Chicago. Everybody welcome and thank you for joining us and taking the time to learn with us. For those of you joining us again, we are very happy, happy to have you with us again. Please feel free to share your questions in the Q&A. For those of you whom I've yet to meet, I'm the founder and CEO of the International Social Impact Institute, which I founded last year seeking to level the playing field for social impact leaders and organizations uh, from and serving communities of color and historically underserved and marginalized communities across the US and around the world by providing access to the resources, knowledge, and networks that will enable those leaders and organizations to thrive despite the various obstacles they've so very often encountered. We've been doing so through initiatives such as the digital storytelling and fundraising series with King Badwa Foundation US and Giving Tuesday and others with Civicus Global Alliance, Nelson Mandela University in South Africa, and the Resource Alliance in the UK, among others. I should note that I'm also an adjunct assistant professor of fundraising in the Center for Global Affairs at New York University, for which I've recently developed a professional certificate program in digital fundraising and in which I teach two courses. I'm pleased to introduce you to my fantastic NYU colleague, Kathleen, Kathleen Murphy Toms, who is also the Director uh, of Digital Strategy at Giving Tuesday, and who last week miraculously pulled off the seemingly impossible, the all day 2021 Giving Tuesday Summit that attracted 10,000 registrants and is and in which I was fortunate to present a session alongside representatives from major digital platforms such as LinkedIn, Facebook, MailChimp, Twitter, Zoom, and others. Kat, please tell us a little bit about yourself and welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. And that was an absolute whirlwind. I'm still un amazed and forever <laughs> will be. Um, I'm Kat. I'm, as Liz mentioned, I'm the Director of Digital Strategy at Giving Tuesday. And before joining the Giving Tuesday team, I directed communications at my statewide philanthropic association. We were an association of all nonprofits in the state of Illinois, uh, and I supported them in various ways between uh, training on digital communications uh, primarily. Before that, I was a field director on Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. And these days I study digital tools, their implications for things like movement building, uh, and I teach community organizing to NGOs all around the world, including, as Liz mentioned, uh, at New York University come spring when my first class starts. I'm so excited and thrilled and grateful to Liz for everything. Pleasure to be with all of you today. Thanks for having me. 
Thanks, Kat. We're psyched to have you with us as well. Um, you know, before we respond to the questions that were submitted through the survey tool, and then the questions that you, all of you are submitting through the Q&A section, we'll provide you with a bit of an overview about Giving Tuesday, because we recognize that for some people, this is really, really completely new. Um, some of you may have seen my presentation during the Giving Tuesday Summit, and you may recall that I began by sharing that the first time I ever presented about Giving Tuesday to an international audience was in fact in December of 2012 during the Eastern Africa Resource Mobilization Workshop in Mombasa, Kenya, hosted by the Kenya Association of Fundraising Professionals. And during that time, I indicated that it was such an excellent way to catalyze giving for the social sector during the giving season, right? So even though um, there may, there, you know, Thanksgiving is a holiday that that anchors Giving Tuesday in the U.S. Uh, and isn't necessarily the case in other countries. That doesn't matter. We're actually during that period is a real giving season, so that we really need to figure out how to capitalize on that. I've since shared about Giving Tuesday around the world and spearheaded campaigns, including for um, Africa Tikkun, for which I, I previously served as USCO, and integrated Giving Tuesday into a whole larger giving and advocacy week we created called Mandela Legacy Week, which culminated in our um, commemoration of the passing of our great chief patron, Nelson Mandela. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, Giving Tuesday has inspired millions of people worldwide with a vision of a global culture of giving that transcends generic monetary donations and encourages simple acts of kindness and generosity capable of putting smiles on people's faces. According to the 2020 Global Trends Giving Report, 17%, yeah, the 17% of global donations in 2019 were made on Giving Tuesday. Uh, for nonprofits that seek to solve society's problems and offer help to the marginalized, an ability to incorporate fundraising models like that of Giving Tuesday to engage supporters and donors is crucial. The session built upon the first two in the series. Uh, the first one was last Monday in which I taught about the fundamentals of digital storytelling and fundraising and the 2021 Giving Tuesday Summit last Wednesday, which tapped into the best practices, creative ideas and inspiration for rallying your community to do good on Giving Tuesday. In today's session, you'll be able to ask Kathleen and I directly about how to activate your supporters on Giving Tuesday and beyond. And my colleague, Portia Afosuado, We'll share links to the recordings of the digital storytelling and fundraising session, along with the 2021 Giving Tuesday Summit for your future viewing. Kat, can we please go ahead and get some history about Giving Tuesday around the world uh, from you, about, a little bit about Giving Tuesday every day, which makes, which is exciting because that means you can really incorporate it into your own giving days. And then what, what opportunities are, are exist for those who are interested in integrating any of them into their supporter engagement efforts? Absolutely, my pleasure. So as Liz mentioned, Giving Tuesday was created in 2012. It seems like ages ago. It was the earliest days of the hashtag. And when we first created this, I remember distinctly having to, to explain to people, no, it is pound Giving Tuesday. No, really, there's a pound ahead of it. Uh, and here we are in 2021 in a different world technologically. But the idea started, it was really a simple one. It was what if we created a day for folks to do good? And, and good in whatever way that meant to them, not necessarily monetary, because generosity is everything. It's, it's, it's giving our voice, it's giving our testimony, it's giving our advocacy, whatever it is that we have to give, even if it's really small. Uh, and over nine years, this idea has grown into a year-round global movement that inspires millions of people to give, to collaborate, celebrates every single type of generosity. So Giving Tuesday 2020 generated $2.5 billion in giving. Uh, I'm still astounded by this. Every time I say it, I feel like I need to repeat it. $2.5 billion in giving in the United States alone in 24 hours. And on top of that, it's inspired millions of people to volunteer, to perform acts of kindness, to put smile on their neighbor's face, to help out just a little bit, to give whatever it is that they can. This generosity uh, that was driven in a 24-hour period on Giving Tuesday last year is more than the total annual giving of any private foundation other than the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So talk about the power of everyday individuals coming together for good. And while many think of Giving Tuesday as a fundraising day, it's so much more than that. 
The actual mission of Giving Tuesday is to reimagine a world that's based on radical generosity. This notion that someone else's suffering should be as intolerable to us as our own suffering. And this value is, of course, very common in other parts of the world, particularly in Africa, when we think about Ubuntu and Harambi and countless other traditions around the world. It's a missing part of society in a lot of other places, though. And we believe that if people flex their generosity muscles, if they create a habit out of giving where one may not have existed before, uh, that they're more inclined to other pro-social behaviors, everything from civic engagement to voting to activism, and that generosity provides the key to a healthy civil society everywhere. This image on the top of this slide, uh, these are our Giving Tuesday Liberia leaders. For Giving Tuesday Now, which was a, an emergency COVID relief Giving Tuesday that we did uh, last year, it was still a world whirlwind. Um, these leaders rented a bus and they drove people and essential workers to their jobs. Uh, they drove people to job interviews completely for free. Uh, they knew that people were out of work. They knew that people needed to get to their job interviews, didn't have a way to get there. And so they rented this bus and it was amazing show of generosity. Uh, on the bottom is Giving Tuesday Ghana. Uh, for Giving Tuesday Now, they organized a delivery of food and water to those most in need in their communities. They organized loans for the unemployed, uh, and they started to create digital solutions for spreading awareness about COVID-19 and ways to prevent it. Really absolutely amazing. Uh, it's just a testament of generosity being shown in a thousand different ways. So there's activity that takes place on every country and territory in the world, plus the International Space Station last year, which tweeted about their favorite cause. Uh, so nearly 80 nations have official Giving Tuesday movements. And what we mean by that is that they have a leader in their community, usually it's the Philanthropic Association, um, that works toward promoting generosity year round through the Giving Tuesday model. They do things like organize panel discussions. They organize forums on the topic of growing generosity in their nations. They build data labs, much like the one that I'm going to talk about in a minute on the Giving Tuesday global side, to study the drivers and impacts of generosity locally and explore giving patterns and provide free information to NGOs based on that data. The Giving Tuesday country leaders adapt the movement to fit their cultural needs. So you'll see a lot of them will take the Giving Tuesday heart logo and wrap it around in their country flag or their country colors. And we love that. We encourage creativity. Giving Tuesday is an open source movement, and we want folks to take it and make it local. Um, but the, the common thread that all of these country movements have is this value that we all share as humans, that giving back to each other and this value of generosity is critical to our very souls. Uh, for me, the most impressive opportunity in all of Giving Tuesday is the implication of creating a worldwide network of really highly interconnected social sector leaders a collective of collectives, if you will. They communicate on a daily basis. They share ideas. They support each other. They, they share what, what ideas work for, for a certain country in Asia that might work for a country in uh, Latin America. That's what the Giving Tuesday movement is all about. The power of many individuals coming together to create change, to share what they can, when they can. Uh, and we can do so much more by connecting and acting together. Giving Tuesday Global operates the largest philanthropic data collection ever assembled. Um, it's astounding. We work all year long to uh, collaborate with donation platforms, payment processors, uh, workplace giving portals. The list is enormous. Uh, folks who are in this space to, to, sh to share data. One of the projects that the Data Collaborative did last year was to conduct some global market research. And the opportunity to grow generosity is immense, particularly in Europe and Africa. In Africa, 96% of the people who were aware of Giving Tuesday reported that it inspired them to be more giving. Uh, and 52% of participants globally say that the reason that they donate on Giving Tuesday or the reason that they give is because they want to be a part of a bigger group of people doing good, which makes complete sense. And part of the key to why Giving Tuesday works so well, it creates this moment that is happening globally uh, that inspires folks to give and that they want to be a part of. 
Giving Tuesday is providing a gateway to giving for youth. We found out in this survey that 82% of our participants uh, are age 18 to 34. Uh, and based on this insight, we started a next gen philanthropy program. It's called Giving Tuesday Spark. You can find it via our website, givingtuesday.org. Um, and it's a coalition of young people who are out there building movements within their own work and sharing uh, best practices and ideas and helping each other. And it's really brilliant. Last week, as Liz mentioned, we hosted an epic 11 hour live stream. Uh, with every social media platform, we think it might be the first time that every social media platform has agreed to appear virtually on one stage. I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, and they came to share best use of their tools, not just for fundraising, but to build movements for your cause. That's what social media is all about. It is about rallying your people to do a variety of things, not just fundraising. Uh, platforms like Canva and MailChimp joined us to share best practices in design and email uh, marketing respectively. And they also shared uh, some really great links to free tools that you have available to you. Uh, so do check it out. Uh, there's a link here where you can access it. You'll get a link later on too. Um, it's a long live stream, but we've got it divided up so you can pick which sessions uh, work for you. Uh, and giving every Tuesday. We had an idea early this year that what happens if Giving Tuesday becomes every single Tuesday. This is about flexing those generosity muscles. And so we created a campaign called Giving Every Tuesday. Each week has a different theme. Uh, so some of them might be uh, literacy or helping animals or advocating for disability rights. Uh, and there's a little mobilization that happens every single week. So we'd love to join, we'd love for you to join us. Uh, you can share, you can collaborate with other organizations around the world on a variety of topics and help move the needle on certain causes that are really uh, prescient and critical to all of us. You can find the schedule uh, at givingtuesday.org. Uh, apparently Giving Tuesday is coming in 50 days and so I'm going to have to make a new schedule for next year, uh, but make sure you're on my mailing list so that you can get access to all of those goodies. Uh, thanks, everybody. I appreciate you obliging me uh, and taking a moment to share what the Giving Tuesday movement is all about. Thank you, Kat. Uh, so amazing. Congratulations once again. I mean, 10,000 people <laughs> and all of the platforms, right? Yeah, it's like, wow. uh, yeah. amazing. I'm still, I <laughs> yeah. still have to pinch um, myself. Uh, yeah, and I was watching myself, I was taking copious notes. Uh, I, you know, I was in some of those sessions myself, and I was just like, wow, there's just such a rare opportunity to be able to learn from the platforms directly. Yeah, right. I don't think that's um, ever happened before. It's amazing. No, I'm, I'm going to be referring it. folks to these sessions for oh, a long yeah. time to come. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing, generously sharing the link. So here, here are a couple of questions that have come through. And I can't, I think I'm going to kind of summarize them because I think it's interesting um, a lot of folks, you know, as all organizations actually, you know, the way that all organizations operate is they always need to raise money, right? So they're constantly focused on the immediate, like, money coming in and so on and so forth. And that's important, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you know, when we're talking about this kind of an opportunity, like a Giving Tuesday, or if, if or you do Giving Every Tuesday, or if you tie it to your own specific day that's important in your country for yourself or for your organization, it's important to understand that you want to create that movement, you want to create that energy, you want to create um, an opportunity for people to feel connected and engaged, so like volunteering and stuff, because those are the people who then will not only fund, not only donate to you in the longer run, they're the ones who will then start fundraising on your behalf. Exactly. Right? And, and those are the folks who are more likely to do that. So if you can bring them in in a different way other than first asking them to donate, that's ideal. Right. Um, and so like, for instance, the organization that I, I used to work for, um, they like, you know, we would have companies come in and they would do sort of service projects with us or individuals would come in and do service projects. And that was sort of a, a, a sort of like the first engagement point to then get them to support us in a different way, right? That was sort of the way it works. So I think that people need to understand that, yeah, there, there, there is the giving that you get on Giving Tuesday, but you also need to create that, um, that kind of, um, I guess that that uh, grouping of people, those super fans, who are going to spread it for you. Because there's a question that came in, I think um, um, will really definitely sort of speak to this. The question is: uh, My organization held an online fundraiser, but fell short of our goal. We only got a few donations; it did not go viral. How do we create a viral campaign that raises a lot of funds? 
Here's the first one, and it's related, is my organization has tried crowdfunding, but it didn't work. What are some of the common mistakes that organizations make? So I think they're interrelated. So I'd love to hear from you because you are the movement builder queen. <laughs> I think so. I, I think my, my first inclination, and I always try to temper expectations about virality. You don't have to go viral. You're not going to go viral. Vi achieving virality in 2021 is a lot different than it was in 2012 for us when we first started this thing. It's okay. Your primary goals with Giving Tuesday are going to be twofold. It's going to be thing one is rallying your current supporters. And if you rally your current supporters first, they're going to help you get to that next tier of new donors. Your new donors are not going to be random people on the internet that have happened upon your post on Giving Tuesday. It, it happens. It's not the most likely scenario. The most likely scenario is that you are asking your best donors, your best advocates for your cause to organize a fundraiser on your behalf. And then they can do that on Facebook. They can do that on a number of platforms these days. And then they're, you're going to provide them with a toolkit, sample messaging that they can use, a sample email that they can easily copy and paste because people are busy. So you have to make really easy for them. Sample text messages are great and underutilized. Uh, to get the word out about your mission and your cause to their friends and followers and, and network. Um, and they're going to do this on their Facebook, on their Instagram, on their LinkedIn, because each of those have different networks, as you and I know, each of us have different groups of people on different platforms. At, but the key is to provide a toolkit to help them do that. Some organizations will put their peer to peer crowdfunding helper crew on an email list, on a Google group, on a Facebook group, even just a private group to cheer each other on, to remind folks to start posting about the opportunity. Um, and that's what's going to help you get to those next round of new folks. Right, exactly. So you've got to leverage the, the power of your existing network and your super fans yep. to help introduce you to their network uh, and then spread it, right? So it's not about you doing the heavy lifting as the organization. It's really about you uh, catalyzing those people who really love you already, right? Whether it's your volunteers, um, it's your uh, existing donors, your employees, yeah. beneficiaries, right? The people, you know, if you're, if you're in a situation where that's a possibility to do that, because we used, when, when, when I was with Africa to when we actually created giving, part of Giving Tuesday was giving um, tools to our junior boards. We had high school students yeah. on our junior board. So they weren't necessarily going to go and get the larger do donations, but they could definitely go ahead and rally their friends and their families and so to support the cause on that, on that particular day. Absolutely. So give them a sense and of purpose and a tool. If you have young people to rally, do it. They love, uh, they love doing stuff like this, and they yeah. can. I've had organizations have young people help them out on their social media when they're really low capacity, one person organization. Find a young person. They love it. They're brilliant. They're creative people, uh, and they can help you. Right. So, so I, I think that's it. I think that's a really important thing. I think another way to um, also sort of. Um, capitalize on Giving Tuesday is not only just leveraging or, or um, activating your existing base, but it's also trying to find a match. Because if yeah. you have a match, right, that, that that's only available that particular day, that creates a sense of urgency. Yep. And it gets people a, a you know, way to rally around your, your um, receiving that match, right? Because the thing is, if you don't get, if they don't, if you don't get to the, whatever that goal number is, then you don't get the match. But people want to feel like that yeah, they helped you. Get, There's lots right, of different right. ways to organize those, and you can organize one of those on your own. You don't have to wait for some major corporation to come in uh, with a match. That's not the way to go. You want to organize it yourself. Uh, right. We have a toolkit on givingtuesday.org for just how to do this. Many organizations will pool a fund from their board or from their, from their junior board, from a couple of sponsors who, what happened often last year was folks would have uh, sponsors for their uh, galas and their events and things, and then the event didn't happen, and they were at a loss about what to do. So what they did was pool that was ask those sponsors, hey, would you instead pool together a match fund for our Giving Tuesday campaign? And it was brilliant. Right. It doesn't have to be a lot. Any little incentive uh, is enough for a donor to click through that button today as opposed to tomorrow when they might forget about it. Uh, so matches are a brilliant tool. 
Yeah, no, great, thank you. And Portia's gonna send a, give you a link to that um, toolkit. But here's the thing that like, when you said it, I went like, <sighs> about the calendar invite. Like, what's that? That's like the easiest thing you can do to get your super fans to just kind of rally around this really simply, right? So can you share? It is. I was just like, why didn't I think about this? <laughs> With everybody, everybody reacts the same way. Um, <laughs> think about your daily life right? Uh, yeah. I don't know about you, but if, if something is not on my calendar, it's, and it's showing you my calendar, uh, it's not happening. So put Giving Tuesday on your supporters calendar. You might have different calendar invites for the people who are going to do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for you and a different calendar invite for the folks who you want to give to you. Uh, but send, put, put it on their phone. It's Giving Tuesday. Please support my organization and put a link, a direct link to your donation platform, to your, your donate link, which is ideally mobile friendly, which is maybe something we'll talk about in a minute. Um, it will notify your folks at whatever time it is that you set to give to you. It, at bonus points, you can put a, a, a click to tweet link in the description to ask them after they've given, please share this opportunity and tweet about it and help us build a thunderclap and build momentum uh, to spread. <laughs> I remember thunderclap. I miss thunderclap. Yeah, I, I, me too. They were I actually really in, my, in my WeWork office, which is kind of funny. Uh, I, I still refer to it because I can't find it. I don't think it exists in alternative no. to Thunderclap. So no, it's, it's us creating our own right, Thunderclap exactly. and this is how we do it. We put it on our folks calendar uh, and then they will help amplify our causes. So um, practically but, speaking, how would you do, sorry, because I know some people are going to wonder like, so what does that mean put it on the ev calendar? Do everybody we asks me email? this. We send it, like what do we do? You, you, can, you can do it the same way that you send a meeting invite if you do it on Outlook or if you do it on Google. The key though is you want to make sure that you be you check that box that says don't show all of the email addresses because your your donors don't need each other's email addresses. That's really bad. Uh, just Very make bad. sure that you check that button. It would be like BCCing all mm -hmm. of those supporters, right. right? So just be careful about that. There's another way to do it, uh, adevent.com. And I think it's called Eventable. Adevent.com is one that I use on Giving Tuesday's website. That one will give a link and it provides a little drop down so the user can select which, which type of calendar they use if they're an Apple user or an Android user or Outlook or all of the types of calendars. That's a possibly safer way to do it because the user's clicking. Uh, on right. that link. If you do it that way, you can set it up to where it will uh, send them notification, uh, pre notifications ahead of time. You can set a reminder for two days ahead of time, a reminder for one day ahead of time that it's coming. Uh, Adevent.com is your friend. It's inexpensive. It's not free, but it's inexpensive. Okay, great. So someone asked, what's a match? And what, you know, can you make a definition and an example? What's a match? So a match, can, there, there are lots of different ways that you can construct a match. But the idea is that, that you're able to say to your donor, hey, if you give today, uh, perhaps your match donor wants to be anonymous or perhaps they want to be named, such and such company is going to match your donation 100% or 50% or even 10%. Uh, we've done a lot of research on matches and it turns out that a 10% match is just as effective as a 100% in getting that donor to go take that next extra step and actually click that button. It doesn't matter how much. So it could be a fund that you're pooling from your major donors and you're gonna tell people that uh, their matches are gonna be matched 10% uh, if they give within the next 24 hours. You could organize it where we unlock the match if we raise a certain amount of money from our everyday givers. It could be we have a goal of $5,000. If we hit $5,000, our pool of friendly, wonderful, generous supporters uh, will give us an additional $5,000. There's a, a bunch of different ways to organize it. And, and in my experience, the funder, so the funders for the match like that because they, they, love can, it. they double their impact, right? Yep. There's that, that sense that, and so there, there's something, there's exciting about, something exciting about that for them to be part of that with you. So uh, that's a great example. Thank you. Um, and so we are a couple other questions. Um, Thanksgiving is, you know, uh, is not, is not a known holiday in my country. What are some examples of countries lo lo leveraging local holidays to spur giving? 
So most countries do Giving Tuesday on Giving Tuesday, that third uh, that third Tuesday after in November, it's the second Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Um, most do it that way. The one country that does it differently is Giving Tuesday India. They have a long-standing global tradition called Don Utsav. I'm probably butchering that and mispronouncing it, but it's it's very similar to Giving Tuesday. It's a week-long celebration where folks go out and do what they can in their community. And so our Giving Tuesday India leaders said, hey, actually it doesn't make any sense for us to do this the same time that y'all do it. We're going to do it in October. Uh, so we, we get two Giving Tuesdays each year, right. which is great. Um, the date doesn't really actually matter. Uh, we could have chose any date at all, but now it's just become tradition that is the, it's this one particular Tuesday per year. Uh, but we're pushing for it to be every Tuesday. Like, what does the world look like if we have Monday motivation hashtag and Wednesday wisdom hashtag? Well, Giving Tuesday can be the hashtag for Tuesdays. And we can all wake up thinking about what sort of small action we can take in our community to improve it. Yeah, no, I love that. I think that's really, really great. Um, and so we have another question, which is, how can I turn a one-time donor into a recurring or monthly donor using digital tools? Aha, one of the best. Yeah. Uh, get them in on Giving Tuesday. So our data shows that when folks are introduced to your cause on Giving Tuesday, we don't exactly know why this is yet. It's that hope information is coming soon, hopefully, but we, we know is those folks stay around longer. So often organizations will run a, a monthly giving program, launching it on Giving Tuesday. And there we're perhaps there's a match tied to it, doesn't have to be, but we are looking for 100 regular donors to support our cause monthly at five or ten dollars a month. Uh, and kick that off on Giving Tuesday. It's a great goal for Giving Tuesday. It's a longer term goal. The other way I've seen folks do it is run a regular Giving Tuesday campaign with a goal of seeking new individual supporters. Don't mention anything about monthly. A couple of weeks go by after Giving Tuesday and they'll set up a MailChimp or a via email, like an automated welcome email that will drip out automatically to only to these new folks that you've obtained on Giving Tuesday, your new Giving Tuesday donors, to introduce them to your cause, to give them the whole backstory that they might not have been able to get on this one 24-hour period of Giving Tuesday. Uh, some case studies, some illustrations of your impact every couple of weeks to get them introduced to your mission, offer other ways for them to get involved, because people love that. They don't like just giving money. They like offering their expertise. They like offering their insights and their own lived experience to your mission. Um, and that's another way that you can introduce the idea of converting these folks to monthly givers over time too. Huge mistake that we used to see and we're seeing it less and less now as time progresses, but a huge mistake would be to completely neglect and forget about your new Giving Tuesday donors. Used to happen a lot more. Folks are more cognizant of it now and we need to foster those relationships. Right. And the other thing is, given the timing of Giving Tuesday, you actually could tie in messaging around getting people to start giving you on a monthly basis beginning of the year. Right. So new yep. giving habits, new year and really kind of um, tying that all together. I think that that would be really powerful. But here's the great thing, too, is that, you know, asking someone to give you thousand dollars one time versus giving it to you over a period of time or hundred dollars, whatever it may be. It's a lot more palatable when you say it's just, you know, just for a, a cup of coffee, you know, every month yeah. or whatever it may be, you can help us to, you know, solve this particular problem or to address this particular challenge. So there's also the messaging around that and people who may otherwise not feel comfortable giving you a seemingly larger amount on that one day would feel more comfortable engaging with over the year, over, over the year. But it's also important that you're not just, you know, kind of waiting for them to, 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 to give you that funds, but you're also reporting throughout and yes. sharing with them, like keeping them inspired, giving them opportunities to get involved in other ways as well. So, um, okay. So here's, here's a question. Um, we only get a few, we only get a few small donations online, typically under $50. Uh, most of our funding comes from large grants from foundations and government. Why is it worth it to spend time developing online fundraising when the gift levels are so modest? Well, diversifying your funding streams, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, you don't know if or when those government funds are going to go away. 
uh, frankly, and you need to be careful of that. Foundations, God bless them, but they make strategic decisions sometimes and they cut programs and they cut funding and they move on to other new shiny missions. Sometimes they do that. Uh, so it's critical to diversify your funding streams, but your supporter streams in general. There's something to building a movement for your cause amongst everyday individuals. It's empowering for not only your staff and your organization, but the people who you work for, uh, your clients, everyone involved here. Um, and you can do that through donations, but you can do that through building a grassroots movement for your cause online, people who support you in other ways, people who share your mission, uh, people who are out there volunteering for you and out there uh, at mission every single time you ask. Yeah, I no, I agree 100%. And, and, you know, something that's also important to note is that, um, you know, just because someone comes in as a $5 donation, right, a $5 donor at one point, doesn't mean that that's where they end up, right? It's important for you to start understanding, engaging with them to understand, you know, how else you can inspire them to give more. But here's the thing, even if I may be a junior professional, or I may not necessarily have a lot of money to give, but if I work for a company, I'm, I would be eligible potentially yep. to give, to donate to you and have my company match that donation, right? So you've got to understand that the, lots of the, the different ways that you can then connect with, with you know, folks who come in at a, at a smaller amount, right? Um, so that's one way is to, to, to be able to get the match from the company. But then um, you can then get them to volunteer. And there are a lot of companies that will give to you if their employees volunteer with you, right? So yeah. it's just understanding that the lifetime value of that donor and not trying to just get that one quick donation in and out. Yep. That's that you're, you, what you're gaining is that $5 supporters network. And their expertise exactly. and everything else about them. Now it's not just that five dollars. And if you foster that relationship well, it can unlock a lot of doors. Absolutely. And those, yeah, those could be. And the thing is, you want to get people to fundraise on your behalf, right? So yep. even if I don't have more than five dollars, I may have a network that can, you yeah. know, I can, I, I can activate to support you beyond that and get the word out and signing petitions and and, and so on and so forth. So. So I think that's good. Um, here are a couple other questions. My board is skeptical about investing in online fundraising because the gifts are small. What are the other different, what are the different ways of measuring a successful online camp fundraiser besides dollar amounts? Um, new donors, uh, re-engaging previous supporters, engaging monthly donors, engaging a thousand other different communities and, and, who, and who it is that those networks grow to exponentially. Um, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Yeah, um, I agree. Okay, so um, my organization has limited budget. Can you share some names of platforms that provide digital tools? For instance, uh, automated emails for free, free Photoshop of pics for different platforms. Fo oh, oh. Free pics, that's Canva. Yeah, and uh, okay, so I have two things for you, Canva. Well, no cost or no way to set up, wait, low cost or no cost way to set up credit card portal. Okay, I have all of those things. Right. Give Lively is a really great fundraising platform. Mm -hmm. I have to say that the, the person who invented or is the CEO of Give Lively is on Giving Tuesday's board, but we actually really think this is a really brilliant website and would be recommending it anyway. Um, it's 100% free. Uh, it, it provides mobile friendly giving, which you need to make sure that you have, especially these days. If you introduce any barrier whatsoever to giving to your organization, it's not going to happen. Somebody, you want to create as little space between that first, that person being inspired to press that donate button and them actually typing in their credit card number. That should be minimal space. You don't need their mailing address right now. You don't need any, you don't need their t-shirt size, any of that. You use all that as an opportunity to reach back out to that donor later on to gather that information. But you want to slim down and create as frictionless as possible uh, donation experience for your donor. Um, free graphic tools and photo tools, canva.com. I'm going to sound like I'm a commercial for canva.com, but there's no better tool. We have canva.com. We partnered with canva.com to, if you go to canva.com slash giving Tuesday, you're going to find a whole bunch of 
free pre-packaged Giving Tuesday templates that you can use. Uh, and you can insert your own photos, you can switch it to your own colors, you can um, do all kinds of things with these, uh, these tools. But Canva is an unbelievable tool. They have a program called Canva for Nonprofits, and you get a whole bunch of other tools for free to you. There's Canva Pro, which most folks pay for. You don't pay for that as an NGO. Um, I'll drop the link in here. The, the, link, the link to that is on the Givers and Friends Summit page too. All of these things that I'm mentioning are there. We also partnered with Paxels.com this year. They helped us curate a, a really great bank of stock images for change makers. There are pictures of people giving that you can use in your graphics and your uh, materials for giving. Is it like today. Pixels but P-A? Paxels, P E. Uh X-E-L-S. Oh. I'll find okay. a link for you somewhere. Right. Sure. Portia can look at it. Portia can do that for us. So we can <laughs> chat. She's been, but she's been actually a copying um posting for us right now. Portia's Thank you, Portia. On it. Yeah, like totally on it. Thank you, Portia. Um, and let's see. Uh all right, let's see what else. What does Madge already got that? My board is skeptical. Um Okay, my organization is great about inviting people to visit our museum, see our exhibits. Um, how do we use digital tools to make supporters abroad feel connected to us? Zoom. Zoom. So many great campaigns this year, these past couple of years, because we couldn't do in-person events. And so folks would translate their Giving Tuesday events or other fundraising events into a virtual experience. So how cool is that if you can show someone from around the world what it is you do on the ground uh so i'd see folks just and they would just stream from their phone or live streaming you can the power of the device that's in your pocket is really immense folks would live stream on location sometimes they would interview clients you have to get their permission of course um they would have their ceo come on and talk about why the mission matters so much to them they would have a, a slew of supporters come on and talk about why they're why they get involved with their mission and how it is that they get involved with their mission there's so much you can do online it it blows my mind every single time uh zoom has some new fundraising tools built into it you can learn all about them at the givers and friends fest there's a summit uh session that Zoom led where they introduced their new fundraising tools. They are available globally and the links to access them are in there. If you are in the United States, you just click on the button. If you're in Canada, you just click on the button, but elsewhere you have to email them and say, hey, I would like the Zoom tools and they will help you and they will hook it up for you. It's, it's, it's awesome. There's a thermometer inside. When folks donate, they get access to a Zoom background that says I donated. Uh, it's that. really cool. It's really cool. It's it's really cool. The thing, the ways that in nonprofits have been innovative around translating their programming into online, it's amazing. Yeah, I love that. I didn't see that session. I'm going to watch that session. I love that. I think that's great. Zoom's really like really stepped up a lot. They have, you know, and you can live stream yeah. from Zoom. Like so, there's buried in here in our Zoom. We can set it to live stream this meeting if we wanted to to over to right. Facebook. Right. There's a lot you can do. Exactly. Um, I love it. And, and, and um, yeah, no, I'm going to definitely check that out. Thank you. Sometimes I feel like I'm pestering our supporters with emails. We don't get a lot of donations. How do I change the behavior of our donors to give? We can't change their behavior. You can, oh, slowly. You can inspire them. I mean, I, How do I slowly. know when my online outreach is less inspiring and more well annoying? How much outreach is too much? Um, I think, can I, before, before you yeah. jump in, I just want, there's, this actually is across the board with everything. Yeah. We spend so much time as organizations assuming we know everything about what our donors want. But one simple thing you can do is ask them, right? You have survey tools, you have a lot of different ways to ask them, you know, what kind of content are, you know, are you interested in? Um, how frequently would you like to be communicated with? Um, you know, what are the different ways you'd like to get involved, right? So it's really listening to them, hearing what they want, um, and then really kind of adjusting your your schedule because I think that it, and people like to feel like they've been listened to right that's the, that, that that's it they don't want to feel like they're just a checkbook to you they want to feel that you're really bringing them in you're taking into consideration what's important to them um, and that's what's going to inspire them to remain connected to open your content to share it to to donate and to, to do you know whatever it is that you you know whatever calls to action that you uh, provide them go ahead Kat Exactly. As, as long as you're not making this transactional and treating them like an ATM, you're okay. Um, we get this question 
a ton. How much email is too much? Am I bothering my donors? Uh, and what we've learned over nine years is that generous people give. And this sounds really obvious, but uh, people often look at it the other way. They'll say like, oh, I don't wanna ask that person because they already gave. In commercial marketing, this is the opposite, a way we look at it, right? If people are spendy, they're going to spend. If you want to predict somebody's behavior, look at what they did in the last 30 days. Use your data, uh, use your survey tools to find out what the right balance is for your folks. Uh, and we need to recognize that these generous people are our customers and we're, what we're giving them is an opportunity to participate in your cause and to, an opportunity to raise their hand uh, and important. get involved. This is really important because... Um, I think I think that is such a key shift that needs to happen is we have to understand we're not begging. Right. Um, we're we're not like hoping that we can like trick them into giving to us, right? It's yep. that we have to understand that when people give to us, it's we're actually helping them to connect to what's important to them, right? So there has to be that alignment. So when you're telling your story, when you're thinking about what your unique value proposition is as an organization, you need to also understand how that aligns with the, the donors and different supporters you're trying to connect with. And that's how you're going to create that relationship. So it's, it's important to understand that you're developing a relationship and helping someone to fulfill their desire to be of help, to make a difference. Um, and, and, and so if you re, re kind of, if you shift your thinking, then the way you communicate with them, the way that you engage them is going to be very, very different. And I think it's important that we recognize that because I know, especially like in developing countries, the donors here, and then the organizations feel like they're like here and we in the institute have really been trying to under to, to create a more um sort of equal path equal kind yep. of uh, collaboration because whether it's a foundation a corporation an individual high net worth individual who's supporting you you are helping them with their mission whether it's personal or, or you know uh, institutional so it's important to understand the value you bring to the to the equation and 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 and, be, and act accordingly I don't mean to be on a soapbox, but you no, that's it. You nailed it. You nailed it. And that's that's what Giving Tuesday is all about. How can we all, how can we take what it is that we as NGOs have to offer and help get it out to the rest of the world? People want that. They crave that. We've learned that now more than ever. All people want to do is help, especially when disasters and it's been crisis after crisis. People are yearning for a way to help. So give them that. And, and in fact, giving went up last year. Yeah. You know, yeah. when, when, when a lot of people lost their jobs or is, there's a lot of uncertainty, but it's when people kind of rally, right? That's when yeah. they said, you know, we really need to come together, right? To yeah. create a sense of purpose. Um, so let's see. Um, my organization's on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and I'm burnt out. That's Do a we lot. Need to be a, yeah, that's like more than, yeah. I didn't sign up to, to, to be a social media manager. I just want to support work. Yeah, no. My friend, my friends know. Um, I would pick two, maybe. You, this is this is where that survey tool that Liz just mentioned comes in handy. Find out where your supporters are. Where is it that they, what tools do they use? No one uses every single social media platform. And even if they do, they don't need to hear from you that many times. Find out which of those platforms your folks use and focus on those. Maybe, maybe you have an internal goal to uh, bring more young people into your mission. Perhaps you might use TikTok even though you don't have an established base there yet. That might be a case for you introducing a new social tool. But in most cases, just pick the one or two where your most of your folks are. Facebook seems to be a great one. LinkedIn seems to be a great one. But it, it depends on your situation. I'm on every single social platform because we're big and our goal is to actually reach everyone in the world your goal is not that and it shouldn't be that so just focus on where your supporters are and produce really great content versus a ton of perhaps not so great content because you just feel obligated to keep the channel running and so you're just posting the same content over and over again better to focus and produce really great content on one or two platforms than a whole bunch of others and I'm going to say something not to, this is not, not anti-Facebook and not anti-Instagram, but you must know 
that if your the organic reach of your content, your, your content won't reach your audiences organically at the rates they used in the past, you have to be willing to invest some money in advertising in order for your content to be seen on, on Instagram and on Facebook at higher levels. So something that you might want to think about. I'm not yeah, anti Facebook. I'm not anti Instagram. No, Just that's a great point. Know. I don't know that yeah. folks realize that if you have yeah. 5,000 followers on your Facebook page, Oh, there five, 50 people, maybe a hundred people are going to see your posts because yes. the way this algorithm works. So uh, two things, you have to be willing to invest in ads there. You also have to be capturing those people on your email list too. You want to move those people onto your own channels. We don't know what's going to happen to any of these social media platforms at any given moment. They may crash. They may, you have to be able to get word out to your supporters in other ways too. Uh, so start moving them and collecting their email addresses and get them over to your own channels as well. Right. Um, one channel that I've been recommending everybody to to to, go, to move to is LinkedIn. Um, and I wrote an article for the Nonprofit Times. Portia can share it with you. Very detailed. Five, five best practices for leveraging LinkedIn for your nonprofit organization with a ton of resources, including the fact that as a nonprofit organization, you can get 50% off of their service of their, their services. They don't pay me, but that's what I want you to know. Why it's important to know about LinkedIn and how to use that strategically is because it's the number one professional platform in the world. So if you're trying to engage professionals, if you're trying to engage some of these institutions that may not necessarily, like foundations that may not necessarily have a Facebook page, but they may have a, um, a LinkedIn page, I'm not Facebook, but they may have a, may not have a website, but they may have a LinkedIn presence and that will help you to connect with them much more easily. So it's something that I'm 100% pushing um, organizations to really think about very seriously and not only creating those pages, but making sure that their employees are all connected to that page so that when um, when you're trying to kind of get people, you're trying to get your message out, your, your employees can, and, and board members can share your content, but it also enables you to reach a larger audience when you're conducting research. Um, when you see that you have a, no, a higher number of people who are connected to your page, you'll be able to see where the connections are with you know, foundations and people in, in, in other organizations. So 100% LinkedIn is a platform you must consider. Um, okay, so that, wow, the questions are coming through. Let's see. My um, last week, Facebook and Instagram crashed during our, a critical online campaign. How can we guard against the vulnerability of these huge platforms? I know. I'm, I mean, I'm so sorry. This happened two days before my 11 hour live stream. Um, yeah. And I'll tell you why I wasn't worried about it. I wasn't worried about it because I use Restream and my intention was to broadcast it amongst every channel that I own and also embedded onto my website. So I guess backup plan, backup plan, backup plan. I don't think I would ever recommend to somebody that they only stream on uh, Facebook. Now that said, if you're using Zoom, I believe you can only pick one place to stream to. So I like, I like technology like StreamYard, I like Restream that can cross broadcast uh, your productions and your live streams because it's beyond our control. And these what platforms can go away at any time. And then second thing would be make sure you collect all your people. Like I said, you, got, you need to make sure you have these people able to reach them in another way besides just Facebook or Instagram. Someone asked what Restream is. So Restream and StreamYard are platforms where, um, where you can create up like a virtual um, uh, studio. Uh, and so the two of us can be presenting content to you. Um, and streaming to lots of different platforms so that you're not just dependent, you're not just streaming on one platform, you can stream on multiple ones, but go ahead, Kat. Simultane yeah, simultaneously, yeah, simultaneously. It's like no work. It's a couple, you press a couple of buttons in the beginning to set it up, uh, to attach all your accounts. So I broadcast our summit to Twitch, which was great. I had never used Twitch before. I'm a big fan. Uh, you can broadcast to Twitter. You can broadcast to Facebook. You can broadcast to a hundred other platforms that I don't even know YouTube, exist. YouTube, LinkedIn. Um, YouTube, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, if you have access to LinkedIn live, live. streaming, yeah, which yeah, is a yeah. little bit of a barrier that you need to get through. You have to apply with them first. Might take a few weeks. It's worth doing. Um, the link to the application is also on the Givers and Friends Fest landing page. If I also include in the article. Good. Yeah, yeah it, it, no. it's worth because it takes them a while to, to click the buttons and approve you or whatever, but it's worth it. Um, yeah, cross broadcast, have backup um, plans so that 
you're not reliant on solely these platforms because yeah i mean that was it's beyond bad. our control it was bad that, I, that was like whoa what happened yeah <laughs> um okay my organization works with communities that require anonymity Therefore, posting photos of people and places is not possible. Sure. Right. How do we craft a compelling story online without photos or messaging that can out these vulnerable people? Lots of things. Uh, this is part of the reason why we worked on developing this stock image library with Pexels. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to use an actual picture of your client. You can use a stock image of that client or zoom in on somebody's hands, zoom in to another story. Look at um, Humans of New York does a really great job with this. Um, sometimes some, for whatever reason, the, the author of the account will feel like they want to provide anonymity to the person that they're telling a the story about. And that's one of their tactics that they'll use. They'll show somebody's hands or they'll zoom in on another piece of the scene. And then the caption on these Instagram posts is a beautiful, compelling, well-written story about that person and what it is that their life experience was like. These posts always go viral. They're, re they're because of the story, the caption that this person writes is so beautiful and compelling. Um, they write it in a way where you see yourself in that situation, uh, and you don't need to provide imagery in order to do that. There are ways that you can do that with words, for sure. And, and you can anonymize the, the story, right? So yeah. it's not like you have to yeah. necessarily... you don't have to name anybody. No, because we, 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 we work with children, um, and yep. that's yeah. so we couldn't share their faces. Um, and so that's how we did it is you kind of uh, you anonymize it. You, like you said, the hand or we use um, stock photos and stuff. Um, that's also what we did. Okay, let's see what else we've got. Um, um, my, these questions are just like, this is, this is coming through. They're like, uh, welcome to my world, Liz. Yeah, I know. I know it's great. It's, I think it's <laughs> wonderful. Um, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, organization works with communities requiring anonymity. Um, oh, that came through twice. Like that's what happened. Um, I don't have well, let me let me ask you let me ask you a question, Kat. Um, if there if we're talking about an organization that's completely you know just like one person show that has that's responsible for the Giving Tuesday campaign, of, of, which is of, typical, right? Which is typical, which is in most cases, guys. Right. What are the three simple things they can do just to even just get started with this and try it out, um, where they don't have to raise set, spend a ton of money. Um, they don't have to, you know, like, and, and it's not going to require a ton of work. What, what is, what would you give as, okay. as, as sort of tips for people? Best question. This is number one. Um, we made you a workbook, first of all. I will, we'll, we'll get you the link. Um, it's designed for one-person shops. The, what are the things that I absolutely need to do to pull off a Giving Tuesday campaign well? First thing is to set a goal. Make it a big goal. If it's if it's something that you lose you lose sleep over at night, that's a good goal. Have big dreams. Go for it. This is once a year. Set yourself a big challenge. Um, it could be dollars. It could be I want to introduce my cause to a certain number of new donors. I would like to get build up my volunteer core. I would like to build up a core of professionals who are in, will be willing to give me pro bono time over the next couple of years. Set one goal not three goals, one goal for your Giving Tuesday campaign. Um, choose one iconic story that you're going to use to share your campaign. You might repeat this story over and over and over again. You're probably going to be tired of this story, but the average consumer needs to hear something. It used to be like 17 times, I think, was the rule. Now it's like 37 times before it breaks through finally. So you might be telling this story from a different angle, from a different point of view. Uh, you'll probably be sick of the story, but your your audience is not going to be. So so choose your theme for your, your campaign, your one iconic story that you're going to use throughout the Giving Tuesday season. You can launch your campaign ahead of Giving Tuesday, um, and it's often good to do that to at least tease yes. to your donors that it is coming. So You'll want to start setting up some emails, schedule them now, two weeks from it. Hey, it's two weeks to go till Giving Tuesday. It is 10 days to go until Giving Tuesday. And that template, uh, Canva template link that Portia shared earlier has a countdown graphic uh, there that you can use to help you do that. Um, 
and launch your campaign now with those key audiences that you're going to want to use to help you achieve your goal and help you tell this iconic story. So you might have, we talked about this earlier, a coalition of really like hyperactive, really cheerleaders for your cause. You might have them, uh, you might ask them to share your story out with their networks. You might ask them to fundraise on your behalf, but you want to start setting that infrastructure up now so that those folks know what to do and that you're not contacting them two days before Giving Tuesday to ask them to do this. You want to start contacting them now. Give them the tools that they need uh, to work for you effectively and efficiently. If you employ those folks, not literally, but if you if you rally those folks to fundraise on your behalf, it makes your work a heck of a lot easier. That's the key online is rally other people to do the work. Yeah. Right. Whether it's to spread your message um, and or to donate to you. And I think one, well, I shared this in, this in my storytelling session, but it's always important to have a call to action. So if you have a post, not only do you ask people to donate or, or to whatever it is, or to click through, but also say share widely, please, you know, like get yeah. them to share so that you're, so that they're spreading it for you. And people, yep. you see, people want, they want you to tell them what you want them to do. They yep. won't do it on their own, but if you ask them to, they will forward it, you know, and having the, the capability of doing so really makes a very big difference. Yep. People can't come up with the call to action on their own. You need to, you need to be very explicit with what it is that you want them to do. One call to action per post, not 10. Now it's it's a little weird because we say on Giving Tuesday, you want to offer people a lot of different ways to get in. That's in general, but not in one post, you want to have one crystal clear call to action. It's either donate now and share or challenge, tag five, five of your friends and see if you can get them to volunteer with us too. Um, okay, so we have another one. Should my organization require the board to participate in our online campaigns? The board typically doesn't donate. Wow, oh. your board doesn't donate? That's, well, that's this, a bigger problem. That is a bigger problem now. <laughs> uh, a, like a much bigger problem. Use uh, something like Giving Tuesday as a challenge, but yeah, you're right. It, it's it's a challenge. But we need to show that existing supporters will give in an online fundraiser and encourage the others. The board is a bit older and not active online. Could you have your board pool a, a match challenge? Could they all, could we say to the board, hey, we're challenging 100% of board giving. This is what we want to reach. It's important because this illustrates that we have buy-in amongst our board, which is hugely important. And also your investment will go farther because we're going to use it on Giving Tuesday to do a match for other folks and new folks and new supporters. I, I'm, I'm, I, I got, I stopped it. My board, my board doesn't participate. Okay. doesn't, doesn't require, the board doesn't typically donate. Like I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah, that's too. kind of a much bigger, that's a bigger issue there. Your board must give. Like, that's where it's a whole thing. Like, the, your board, if they're not giving to you, then why are they Why are they there? I mean, obviously, there's some some board, you can have boards that are composed of people who, um, you know, who have a certain reputation and that can help you to open doors to other places. But if your board doesn't give, you don't have that core, you're in a lot of trouble. That's a very core support group that an organization needs to have. Your board needs um, to give, or they need to be getting for you. Some organizations get, yeah, right. here in the States, I don't know if this is common abroad, but we'll have a give or get. Um, and you either need to give that yourself or you, this board needs to go out to their friends and family and network on LinkedIn uh, and get that those funds from you elsewhere. Right. Uh, what are some of the key traits I should look for or recruit in a supporter that may be useful in amplifying an online campaign? We have great volunteers in person, but they're not very good with follow through. Make it easy for them. This is where these toolkits that I'm such a fan of come in handy. Um, and I have a few that are on our website too, that they're, they're ready to go. These are a social media toolkit that you would take it, change it into your own language, and then ship that off to the people who are really great at volunteering, but not necessarily so great at posting on social. Sometimes they might need a little training, which is where I've had organizations build a little working group on a Facebook group or whatever and run through, okay, here it is. Here's a tutorial on, it may seem simple to some of us, but it's not to others. Uh, here's a tutorial on some ways that you can help us get the word out about our campaign. Got to make it easy for them. And if that it all all that fails, you can always tag them in the post you create and ask them to share. So at yep. least 
you know, you're creating something that's already there. You tag them in the in the comments and just say, you know, Cat, Liz, please share yep. or please whatever it may be, uh, so that it's right there. It's composed. All they're doing is forwarding it. Maybe they can just add a little note and say, I'm part of this. I love this organization. I volunteer for them. Please help me to support them. You know, if that's yep. if that's what it takes, because sometimes that's what it takes is that people don't necessarily have the time, the bandwidth, and all that. But if it's right there in their face, very easy. It's easier to get them to get involved. Yep. I've, I will, uh, sometimes I'll set up a post and then send them the link on whatever channel, uh, if I have them on text message, hey, can you repost this? You got to make it super easy for them or they're not going to do it. And you can set a lot of this up ahead of time, especially with like the tagging that you just mentioned. You can schedule your posts and tag folks in the bottom of the caption. So what's something you should not do on Giving Tuesday? Well, look, it's kind of meaning... I, I think the first time I hear from a lot of organizations is on Giving Tuesday. I'm like, no, you kind of needed to start before then because there's a lot of noise, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of noise on that day. So how how do I get like I think that you kind of said it already? I, mean, start I, I think that's day. I think that's my don't. I think it's don't reach out to these folks on your email list for the first time in an entire year on Giving Tuesday. They might not remember who you are. They might not remember how they ended up on your email list. Back it up a little bit. Start emailing them soon. You could do it today and say, it's 50 days to go, go till Giving Tuesday. Here's what we have planned. And here's some ways that you could think about helping us. Uh, would you consider raising your hands to be our social media ambassador and start collecting social media ambassadors that way? Start asking your folks now how they want to engage with you on Giving Tuesday. And that's an opportunity to amplify your campaign. Absolutely. Um, everyone's talked about online fundraising, how much of our budget should we aim to comprise of online donations? It's hard to understand a good goal to try to achieve. It depends on too much. Yeah, it depends it on too much. I don't know if I'd be able to offer a number on that. Um, it depends. I don't know where. Could, maybe if this person can write again the country they're in, because like you can use like an MR, MNR benchmark, so one of these reports to see like if you're like a human rights organization, what percentage of of donate? Well, I think it's donations across different digital platforms. Uh, no, Blackbot. The Blackbot um, giving report shows you the split between online and 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 um other and offline. donation and, offline and it's going to depend so much on your organization yeah, and it, how it how your supporters like to give um online might not be the end all be all for you it may not maybe you're maybe a hundred percent of your folks really just like to give cash or write checks or whatever or give offline um but all, all, but see, online um, in in the, in, the, in on the across the African continent also means uh, WhatsApp or whatever yeah. messaging platform, right? So sure does. So folks need to think about that. So you don't necessarily have to put yourself on you know these other platforms if they don't work for you. So maybe mobile is the way that you want to go. Um, I wrote a piece about how to use WhatsApp um, for, for fundraising um, about a year and a half ago. I, I think some of the content has to be updated, but um, there because WhatsApp is owned by Facebook, if you're already approved with Facebook Pay, you would that they use the same sort of pay functionality. So that's sort of one-click pay um, to be able to make those donations. But let's say if you're in Kenya or one of those places, you could have like an M-Pesa link or you use one of the other links through, so you use, so you communicate to people through, um, you know, through WhatsApp or whatever messaging platform and using a link to some mobile payment um, uh, uh, service. That could be the way that folks want to use this, right? So I think that I, I want people to understand that that's what we're talking about as well. Yeah. WhatsApp is totally underutilized. People love it. People love yeah. feeling like they're a part of an intimate cohort of people who are helping your organization in a big way. And if you can make mm -hmm. them feel like that uh, by being part of a WhatsApp group where they can exchange ideas about how to move the needle on your cause, they can get more inspired. And in that group, they can then forward any message that you post, they can forward it to their network, right? Yep. So uh, up to five people directly. Um, so that is something absolutely be, that we, we should be considering. Um, and, 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 and it's right there, it's on your phone. It's right yeah. and you got it. it. And so- And that's um, the key, you have to get this stuff onto people's phones. It's right, it's on Bottom their phones. Line. Yep. And, and people are, by the way, people are already doing this for paying for, when, when they're fundraising for weddings, when they're fundraising for funerals, like in their other, in their personal lives, they're using these devices. They're using this functionality. So it's just figuring out how to repurpose it for the 
for, for an organization to be able to capitalize on something that people are already comfortable doing. Yep. The consumer sector is already all over it. I've been getting messages about products that I looked at on Instagram. It's, it's amazing. It's yeah, amazing. It's, but we can do these things too. Yeah. Um, Portia, can you please share the WhatsApp article? I wrote it for our nonprofit Tech for Good. It's, I think it's like three best practices or five best practices for using WhatsApp for fundraising. Um, so we'll, we'll, someone asked for that article. Yeah, the primary way we communicate with our, with our supporters, wait, for WhatsApp, yeah, they wanna know about the article because that's the primary way they communicate with their supporters. The call to donate is always buried under a bunch of messages. So get to it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, experiment post it them. often, post experiment with emojis to highlight it in different ways. Right. And also images, right? Using images. Because sometimes, because I think you don't want to just be text heavy. You want to use images to sort of call someone's attention to the fact that this is a fundraising appeal um, and even embedding like the short code or whatever it is that you're going to use for people to be able to make a donation to you so they can see it visually and then they can click to do whatever they need, whatever you need them to do. Post the image separately and then underneath that post any instructions that you want to provide to your group. That way the folks that are in the group can press forward on just the image file and not have your explanation in text along with that underneath. Uh, that way they can craft their own message when they're forwarding it. Right, exactly. So I, I think that's great. Well, wow, this is fun. I feel like I'm like, I'm learning a lot. I'm I need to be taking notes I, myself. I love doing, I love doing yeah. these. Yeah, these, these, this is really fun. Um, so folks, we have about 10 more minutes or so that we're gonna be able to continue um, to answer questions, so keep them coming. But I wanna make sure you don't leave because we have, um, a, we are going to have a Slido um, uh, sort of a tool that's going to enable us to find out what, what you got from this session. It's important for us to understand what, what resonated with the most with you to understand what else you may be looking for, but just, you know, how, how the session worked for you. So if you can just hang in with us a little bit more, we'll be sharing that with you. So Portia just shared the WhatsApp article and let's see what else we have coming in. Um, so what did you do after the, the, the after this like momentous, like, you know, sort of effort to create. Knocked out on the couch. Of, yeah, I, I didn't want to bother you. I was like, let me just like, let me just give you some space because it was like I I felt like it was a lot, and I just did one it session. It was a lot. It was a lot. So I had even despite me pre-recording all of these sessions, which I yeah. cannot recommend enough. It's another reason to oh, use something important. like Restream and Streamyard. You can pre-record these sessions and air them as live. Perhaps you take this approach on Giving Tuesday. Uh, record Zoom sessions with your board members this week earlier, just get it off of your plate. It makes your life a whole lot easier rather than stressing about how I have to do this live stream. Um, so that was something that I did that I highly, highly recommend pre-record as much of it as possible. And then these tools, Restream StreamYard, allow you to broadcast it. Folks don't know the difference, whether it's actually live or pre-recorded. Um, it also allowed me to caption the files. Facebook has auto captioning, but most other platforms don't. Um, and Facebook's auto captioning, it's better than a stick in the eye, but it's not 100% correct. Uh, so pre recording let me caption everything in English, it let me caption everything in Spanish and a couple other languages too, so that we would have that available uh, for folks in the recordings afterward. Right, especially because, you know, if your speakers are, you know, in, in developing countries, the connectivity issues can just be like horrific. So if you, yep. if you have a live stream going and it goes down then your session's over, right? Then, so, and then we have this backup plan. I have all the pre-recordings and that was part of my backup plan too. Now my backup plan A was that it was gonna be cross posting to all of these other places. So I was pretty sure we were gonna be okay. But that backup plan C was quite simply just start releasing the, them as posts, as videos throughout the day. Uh, not necessarily having to be live, but I had everything all queued up in a Vimeo playlist that we could uh, unleash at the time. Back up, back up, back up, back up, back up, back up, uh, <laughs> with, with everything, with everything. Yeah, no, you can't rely, especially with technology, you can't, you, you don't know what's going to happen, right? No idea. Um, connectivity issues. I mean, even, even I had connectivity issues. I'm, I'm I live in New York. That. I'm glad yeah, you said this. So yeah. sometimes some of the donation platforms go down on Giving Tuesday. Yeah. Um, it's not Actually, their fault. It's not our fault. It's nobody's fault. It's just something that happens. So you want to make sure that you have a backup plan to your regular online donation portal too, even if that's just like a PayPal link or something that 
has a little more friction, but it's just your backup plan. It's okay. So you always want to have a backup plan. Yeah, I agree hundred percent on that. Uh, and hopefully your backup plan is not just a donation button on your, on your site. And the reason why I say that if you're, if you're a smaller organization uh, and if you just have a donate button on there and you don't have a PayPal sort of functionality or I have to give to you directly, I'm not going to give to you because I can't trust that your site is secure and it's nothing personal. It's just the way things are right now online. So you want to make sure that you have a link to like a give lively or you're here. You you're, have a third party um, through which you're going to be processing this donation. So I know that my 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 donation is most likely going to be secure. Really important. Really important. And that's stuff you want to start setting up now if you don't have that already. You've got 50 days. So. Right. And and PayPal is always the back. I can I can do a PayPal. Like if you've got a yeah. PayPal. And I, right, and, I, and I say I, that's because I'm constantly testing this stuff myself. I've been doing this for a long time. So I look at this as something and a lot of organizations, you know, it's a, they have a whole different setup. And I'm like, that's not going to get you the donations you need, um, especially now with all the hacks and all the things going on. Uh, really, really critical to think about. So my, my Belgium, my, I'm sorry, my organization is in Belgium where three languages are spoken. Yeah. Should we always have translated messages for each social media post or set up separate counts for each language with, with translating every message our posts can get really long? I bet. So Facebook has this functionality on the back end. You can translate your posts so that you're only posting once. Now you're doing the translation. So actually you are posting three times, but the user gets to select what language it is that they see posts in. So it will automatically show that user the post in their preferred language. Takes a little bit to get set up um, and you will have to do the translation, but it's technology that exists that avoids you having to have separate accounts. At Giving Tuesday, yeah. we do have separate accounts because we are massive. Uh, so we have, there's a Giving Tuesday Italy account, there's a Giving Tuesday Czech Republic account, because I cannot personally manage 80 different language translations, aside from the fact that I'm just culturally not there, right? So we, we do have different accounts, but it's for different reasons. If your reason is solely for language translation, I don't think I would. Um, oh, and, and, and let's say again, because you remember we were talking about the fact that you're probably going to need to do some paid posts. Yeah. Um, some, 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 some posts that you're, um, you can actually target your posts to the people who speak, you know, if, if, if you're able to, dis, to, to distinguish between one um, audience type of, over another, like for instance, for us with Africa Tico and we were in America and then we had a South African um, and that the headquarters was in South Africa. We had an, um, an entity in the UK so we could post to the different audiences. We could, you know, target to the different audiences based on geography. So you could yep. do it that way. If let's say in a particular part of Belgium, everyone's speaking French versus, you know, um, you know whatever it may be. You can, target the you, you can target the language they speak too. There's yeah, a lot there you can you do on targeting on the back end. Right. Um, so, so that's but all that to other... say, I don't think I would start new accounts for different languages. That's too much work for you. It's not necessary. Look at how, how some government accounts do it. Um, Canada has to post, they post everything, two separate posts. They'll post it in French and they'll post it in English, completely separate time. Uh, and the way they have it set up, the users who speak French will only see the French posts. Absolutely. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great one. Okay, so we're um, coming, I just gotten sort of a, a four minute, no, three minute warning before we've got to start wrapping up um, to be able to get into the, um, into the, the, the Slido. Kat, leave us with one huge, like what's that one huge, although, although I got to tell you that, that the calendar invite is a thing that like, <laughs> Blew my the mind. The like, like forever is going to be the thing. Like, I'm like, how did I not? I've been doing this so long. How did I not think about most that, people? Right? Liz, most people miss it. Right, most exactly. people miss it. The, the way I'll, I'll tee this up in, in the old days when we were in person, I would ask folks, what do you think is the number one digital tactic to move somebody to action? Not just on Giving Tuesday, period. You can take this tactic and use it for anything that it is that you want to do. People need that sense of urgency in order to act. And I, if it's not on my phone, it's not happening. If it's not on my calendar, it is not something that I am going to do because people are busy. So your yeah. job is to make life easy for everybody involved, including yourself. 
uh, and get that calendar invite out. Uh, and you can do this now. This could be a reason that you email your folks today. It could be for a couple of reasons. Today, it's, it's Giving Tuesday, uh, is coming up in 50 days. Save the date. Here's a link to get it on your calendar. And here's some ways that we have available for you to tap in and help us out on our Giving Tuesday campaign. Uh, and then I'll send a couple emails like that out over the course of the next month and a half because right. it's coming. Um, get involved. Right, because, because you can send a, you can send an email from the calendar invite. I mean, that's that's right. So whoever's yeah. accepted, right. So then that way you're engaged in getting ready, right? I, I just want to make sure that, that it's clear to people that it's not like you're having to create a whole other email, but it's literally if you, let's say if you have like a Google Calendar that, 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 that people have used to accept your calendar invite, then you can actually send an email using that functionality yep. to everybody. Um, um, get in touch with your local Giving Tuesday movement. That's my last ask of you all. Giving Tuesday is in 80 countries. If you go to givingtuesday.org slash global, you can connect with Giving Tuesday in your country. They have a whole separate bank of tools in many, many different languages. A lot of the toolkits that I described to you are available in many different languages via your country campaign. If you don't yet have a country campaign, we would love to have you. It's a, that, yeah, uh, all, it takes, all it takes is somebody to raise their hand. And our Giving Tuesday leaders tend to work at organizations that have large networks of uh, philanthropic sector type organizations, but they don't have to be. Really, it just takes somebody who is passionate about giving and generosity and growing radical generosity in our world, uh, somebody who is innovative and creative and up to the task. So email us, uh, info at givingtuesday.org. You can DM us on any social media platform to your liking, and I'll connect you with our global lead, and we would love to hear from you. Absolutely. We, wanna, we want to literally take over the whole world with generosity, so <laughs> help us do that. I love it. I love it. And um, so um, I just have one quick, I'm going to answer this because we've got to wrap it up. We have a couple of super enthusiastic volunteers, but sometimes the way they talk about the organization conflicts with our own messaging. How do I wrangle in a volunteer whose heart is in the right place, but their messaging is sometimes a disaster? Well, that's really a function of how you prepare them to, to represent you, right? If you have a kind of an orientation um, that they have to go through, if you provide them with messaging, right? So they're, you know, I, and I don't know what the context is. I don't know if they're speaking to people in person or if they're like sending messages on your behalf, but you can control that in terms of the toolkits that you give to them, right? So if, if let's say you having someone re reach out on your behalf, you can give them a sample email that they can send out and customize, um, you know, on their own that has the core messaging. Um, you can also get them, um, you know, you can also make sure that you go through some, through some kind of an orientation with them before they go ahead and represent you. No one should be representing with you without going through some sort of orientation. But I also think that it has to do with the fact that organizations typically have very, very muddled messaging because they don't have a clear starting line in terms of the core story that's really consistent and, and, and easy to understand that then can then be converted into emails into different types of, of communication vehicles. But I would start with just kind of making sure that um, you um, orient your, your uh, volunteers, provide them any kind of tools they may need, whether it's email content or presentation, or just kind of doing role playing with them um, and, and just kind of go from there. What do you think, Kat? Yep, that's it. You can veil, you can veil a lot of this in a toolkit. They're going to like that. It makes it their life easier for them. Um, ideally, you want to provide them some agency to, to be creative with the messaging to a point. Uh, it should still be on message. Okay. As much as uh, possible. Absolutely. So I think we've come to a point where we're going to have to let Hafiza come back in and start wrapping us up. And Portia's going to share the Slido link. Um, once she does that, then I'm going to pull up Slido. And it's an interactive way for us to be able to see your responses um, to this session that we just held for you. So Hafiza, if you want to just kind of join us before I go ahead and wrap up with everything. And Kat, this was awesome. I could go all day with you. But thank you thank for you having for me. I love these so much. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, likewise. So uh, go ahead, Afiza. Bring us home. Hi, y'all. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, you'll see my face shortly. But in the meantime, I just wanted to make sure to close out with you all. Um, first, I'd like to express my deep appreciation to Liz and Kat. Today's conversation was really interesting to speak with uh, or listen to. 
And I also wanted to point out that um, you provided like a wealth of information. So if you all were looking in the chat, you'll see the many links, but of course we will also have that available at the KBFUS site, um, which you'll receive a follow-up email about that. Um, just in closing, uh, a special thank you to our audience for taking the time out of your busy schedules today. Uh, and following this conversation, we will send you a link um, for this webinar that has been recorded along with the links to many of the resources that were referenced today. Thank you again for joining us. Um, this is the final episode of the October series on digital marketing. And I leave it to Liz to close us out. Okay, thank you, Hafiza. Uh, thank you so very much for this. And Kat, oh gosh, I could get virtual. I'm giving you a virtual hug. Um, everybody, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, spend some time with us today. Before we let you go, like I said, we want you to provide us some uh, feedback. Um, you know, to telling us what the three takeaways you receive from this session are. So Portia, if you could go ahead and um, pull up your screen. I know that you've already shared the link to the, the Slido poll um, and we definitely wanna hear from you. It's gonna, it's actually kind of a cool tool that you should all check out and integrate into your own events. Uh, I love it. I, I, there, there are very few events that I do without it at this point, but it enables us to be able to crowdsource the feedback about a particular event or even during the event, I'm able to kind of use it to um, obtain your, your input. So what we want to know um, is, you know, oh, look, they're already going. Okay, three takeaways, calendar, reminder, having redundancy option for online giving, absolutely, making Giving Tuesday local, customized organization, send drip emails first time, great to giving even to donors, backup plans, backup, 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 backup. mobile friendly, absolutely, collect your audience, pre-record live streaming sessions. I cannot overemphasize that enough because we're fortunate that we're in a situation where this worked, but I can tell you, because I do a lot of training with people outside of the US and they're constantly going down <laughs> when, when we're, we're doing the training. So I know what it's like, um, you know, if you have a live streamed event in, in a place where you don't have stable internet or stable power, really, um, it can be kind of a little bit of a, a, of a nightmare. Matching donations, even 10% are effective. Fantastic. Use just one iconic story to promote. Yes, yeah, so look for that, that story. Um, and if you're looking to figure out how to craft that story, please go ahead and watch the session I delivered last week. And of course, you need to absolutely go through um, the Giving Tuesday Summit because I mean, you it's very rare to hear from all the platforms at once. Like even for me, I've been doing this for a long time. I was there taking notes and I'm going to go back and take Same. Even more notes. It was a lot. It was a lot, uh, but it's great information, not just yeah. for Giving Tuesday. They gave great tips in general. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, so that was super helpful. Um, and we can keep the comments coming through, but thank you to for all of your replies and joining us today. I um, also like to take this time to be, give a big thank you to King Bunwa Foundation US, KBF US, and of course Giving Tuesday and Kat, uh, with whom we've collaborated to bring this bring you the series, along with our other partners, Candid, the European Fundraising Association, the Nigeria Network of NGOs, and the Africa Resource Network. And Mike Machula, thank you very much for all of your support. Have a fantastic rest of your week and please connect with us on LinkedIn, subscribe to our newsletters and access the resources and events uh, that we, we provide to uh, support you in your digital engagement efforts. And definitely take Kat's course on social media uh, fundraising uh, and, and movement building at NYU. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Portia, for supporting us. <laughs> and, and of course, the folks from Faircom, Lindsay, um, and you know, who made, made this a very seamless experience because if we didn't have the technology running, we wouldn't be able to do this. So thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.